like to welcome you to church this morning. It's great that we can gather here and worship our wonderful Lord and Saviour again. Just a couple of announcements. Uh, after the service, we will be holding our GM meeting, but we'll um, go out for a coffee first and then we'll call you back in for our GM meeting. Also, Saturday the 11th, we're going to hold a farewell dinner for the Nuchter and family, so please keep that date free and encourage you all to, to come to that. And also, this morning, we're going to be led by John Mose for the first part of the service, and then the brother Keith Hill from St John's Presbyterian is going to bring the word to us. Have a blessed service. morning congregation this morning um, I'm going to call you to worship with the words from Isaiah chapter 12 verses 4 to 6 where it says on that day you will say give praise to the Lord proclaim his name Make known among the nations what he has done and proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing to the Lord, for he has done glorious things. Let this be known to all, <coughs> to all the world. Shout aloud and sing for joy, people of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel among us. Let's just bow then for a moment of silent individual prayer. Shall we bow? Hear our prayers, O Lord. Congregation, I invite you to stand and receive the greeting of our Lord. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Amen. May grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's commence with singing a song of praise amid the thronging worshippers. It's one where we can um, just think about that we're not just gathered on our own, but here we are as God's people all gathered together to worship him. So let's sing from hymn number 22A, Amid the Thronging Worshippers.
Let us now bow before our God and, and just sing, pray. <clears throat> our Lord, it's just so good to be able to sing your praises and to know that you are the God who, who is in our midst and to whom you provide, all our provision is from you. Lord, we thank you that you are a God who, who loves us dearly, a God who cares for us, who is with us continually, that your spirit is guiding us. Lord, we pray that you will strengthen us then and help us to live our lives so that they may be lives that, that take refuge in you, that praise and honour your name. Lord, we pray that you'd help us to walk in your ways and to do the things you ask us of, to obey you, to live for you, to put aside our, our prejudices and to put aside our, our, our greed and our desire to have everything and our worship of idols. Lord, all these things you call us to do and we want to do them, and Lord, you know our hearts, and they desire to do all these things, to obey you, and yet we fail. And so we need to come before you at this time and ask for your forgiveness, Lord Jesus. We thank you that we can come to you and that your word tells us that, Lord, our sins are forgiven when we confess them before you and that, that you have paid for them on the cross through your blood and through the, your body, that you died for us. But Lord, we can also rejoice in knowing that you have risen again. And because of your rising and being at, on the Father's side, that we have forgiveness in you. Lord, we rejoice in this and we give you thanks for this. Heavenly Father, help us now then as we sit under your word this morning and and hear it, that we may be attentive to it. Hear our prayers as we say them, and our praises as we sing them. Lord, we pray for you to be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. With uh, the, the Lord forgiving us for our sins and, and recognising this, our Saviour is Jesus Christ, help us then now to... Uh, let us stand now to sing uh, the song, Wonderful Grace, the grace that is given to us through the Lord Jesus. Let's stand to sing. <clears throat>
about that wonderful Saviour who loves us. He gives us in his word things to, ways in which we can serve him and serve him greatly. We read in Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 to 18, Finally be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on the full armour of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our strength is not against flesh, flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities and against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore put on the full armour of God so that when the day of evil comes you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, Take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. And then in Matthew chapter 4, we also have direction there of what and how to go about our everyday lives. In Matthew chapter 7 we read, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. This is the direction for our lives, people. This is the way we should go, with the belt of truth around us and with the road that we choose being a narrow and a straight one. At this time now, we're going to look at uh, a, a DVD, I think it is, from uh, Compassion. The Compassionate catalogue is being brought out and from, it's from World Transform. And that, uh, and that we have this short video just reminding us of the, uh, the Christmas giving of the Compassionate Catalogue. Hello, my name is Bert Kuypers and it gives me great pleasure to again present the 2021 edition of the Compassionate Catalogue. On behalf of the Reformed Churches in Australia and New Zealand, we present and showcase wonderful ministries that our denominations are supporting. So we really appreciate your support in the past. It's been wonderful and we are just amazed how that increases from year to year. So this year again, we commend wonderful ministries to you that um, we'd like you to pray about and give towards in Jesus' name. There's lots and lots of things that we put before you. Look at this income generation that we're doing for so many very desperately poor people. You'll find uh, water, resourcing villages with clean water to drink. Uh, what a blessing that is. Uh, there's young girls from the slum. We give them a job. We give them vocational training and um, help them in that way. There's missionary support. There's Bible college students that we try to resource. And so the list goes on of, of great things which we want you to be aware of and be supportive of. This year we'd really like to commend to you um, a special number of gifts. And that's Bethesda, the Disability Training Resource Centre that we have in the Solomon Islands. You'll find that in the catalogue on one, two and three. Bethesda is a, a great place where disabled people can learn new skills to make them useful in their community, to make them productive, to make them self-sufficient. But the place is really run down. We need to do urgent renovations there 
So can I commend that especially to all of you today, Bethesda Disability Centre in the Solomons. So please do pick up your compassionate catalogue at your church. Get hold of a hard copy and don't forget, it's available online as well. So there's a link, use the link to find out about the gifts and it's so easy to make a donation. Please give generously again for Compassionate Catalogue 2021. That in mind, let, us, let me lead you now in our congregational prayer. And um, I think the catalogues, are they, are they available already here? Yes, deacons? No, we, we haven't got them yet. Okay, so you can get that online. Okay, let us pray then. Lord, our Heavenly Father, we do come before you and we thank you that we have this opportunity to also give for the needy of this world and the many places where, where uh, missions are. And Lord, we pray that you would make us generous toward the work in your kingdom, no matter where it would be. Father in heaven, we just then pray for, um, at this time, for the Solomon Islands. And we realise from the news that there is uh, much many problems there through uh, uprising and Lord we just pray that you would be with those especially in in Bethesda uh, that, that place where the people are taught <coughs> with who have disabilities we pray for our uh, w mission there the swim workshops and the swim teams that work there on our behalf Lord we pray that you would um, take care of them, that you would help them to, uh, that we may help them to move forward through our generous giving. And Lord, we pray also for the unrest that's in that country, that Lord, that that may stop, that that people may see that there is a God in heaven who knows about their troubles and that they should bow before you. Heavenly Father, we also pray this morning for the Decrin family, that you'd be with them at this time and strengthen them. Lord, we ask that you be with Jenny and, and the rest of the family and as they need your strength in this time of grieving. Father, be with others who are sick in our congregation. We know there are many who suffer in various ways and who are in various times of being healed and, and made... Uh, where doctors and nurses are looking and caring for them. We pray for their healing. We pray for their strengthening at this time. Father, we pray for um, the children and our young people as they finish school or have finished. And over the next few weeks, they will finish, some, some already. Lord, be with them as they too... Uh, enjoy their holidays and prepare for their holidays and Lord in, in all these things that we may be reminded that there are many ways to go in this world but there are really only two the broad way and the narrow way Lord help them to walk in your love help them to walk as children who belong to you O oh Lord and to do our so that they too would be blessed of you. We pray for families, that mums and dads could care for them. And Lord, we pray for the, for the children <coughs> in schools who, who have difficulties, with those who our mentors see to every, every week up until now. Lord, that you would bless that work, but you would bless them as well as they struggle with uh, family life that is not um, as same as ours, blessed of you. Lord, be with them. Our Father, we pray for our government and, it, and leaders. We, we know we're in unsettled times at this time and the government and the, our leaders in government are making 
decisions. May it be, Lord, that they seek their wisdom and their understanding from you and not from themselves. May it be, Lord, that through our governments we may honour you and we may uh, do what you call us to do, to live for you and to live for one another, that we may show love to our brothers and to our neighbours. Father in heaven, we, we do thank you at this time for the rain that you have sent, the abundance of it, and we just praise you for that, for we have been asking for it and you have sent it. All praise be to your holy name. And Father, we also pray for um, <clears throat> our leaders of the church. We ask that you'll be with them, our elders, our deacons, we pray, Lord, for wisdom for our ministers. And Lord, we pray for uh, wisdom to find another pastor for our church here at this time. We pray for Andrew and Lydia as they prepare to leave us, that you would bless their work in Western Australia and in Gosnells, and that they may be used of you there. Father, we thank you that we now can be together to listen to your words shortly. And so we ask this then in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let us now sing two praise songs. First one is called Living Hope and the second one is All I Once Held Dear. And they remind us of the living hope we have in our Lord Jesus Christ. And, and uh, so uh, let's stand to sing.
before we um, go to the next song, I've been told there's Sunday school this morning, so if the children would like to leave for Sunday school, now would be a good time while we sing the next song.
Please be seated. We're going to read our scripture reading for this morning at this time. Before I do that, it's from it's from Colossians chapter one, the verses fifteen to twenty-three. Just let me lead you in a moment of prayer first. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are our everything. And so now as we open your word, help us to understand it. Lord, as we read it, may it talk to our hearts and our minds so that we may love and serve you through it. Lord, I pray for our brother Keith as he will shortly lead us in the message that you would strengthen him and guide him as well. Lord our God, May your Holy Spirit be among us, in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'll read then 1 Colossians 15 to verse 23. It's titled, The Supremacy of the Son of God. The Son is the image of the invisible God the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church, He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he may have supremacy. For God was pleased to have all things, have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behaviour, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith established and firm, Do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to you, to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. This is the word of God. everyone. Uh, If you haven't met me before or you weren't here last time, uh, my name is Keith Hill. I uh, I work for uh, an organisation called the Australian Fellowship of Evangelical Students. Uh, I work as a a campus missionary and Bible teacher uh, on the the university out here uh, at USQ. Um, How about we pray and then we get stuck into that wonderful passage. Uh, Gracious Father, Paul writes uh, in Colossians that uh, he proclaims Jesus, admonishing and teaching everyone in him to present everyone mature in Christ. So we pray that as we hear Paul proclaim Jesus in this passage this morning, that you would be at work in us by your Spirit to mature us in him. And we pray it in his name. Amen. Well, sometimes not knowing who you're dealing with can go terribly wrong. Uh, A friend of mine was on his way to meet his girlfriend's parents for the first time. Uh, And on the way, 
he was cut off by a woman in traffic. Now, as many young men do in those situations, I think he gave a fairly clear indication that he wasn't particularly happy with this woman's driving. And so you can imagine his horror when he pulled into the same driveway as his future mother-in-law. Not knowing who you're dealing with can lead to all sorts of trouble, can't it? And one of the great dangers that we face when we come face to face with Jesus of Nazareth is not knowing who we're dealing with. When the Apostle Paul wrote this letter to this small gathering of believers that met in the house of Philemon in Colossae, all sorts of false teachers, all sorts of societal and cultural forces threatened to distort their view of who Jesus was. Was he just a political revolutionary? Was he a messianic pretender? Just a wandering peasant? Was he some sort of spiritual being in in the appearance of a man? All sorts of opinions abounded in a culture where polytheism, the worship of multiple gods, was the cultural air that you breathed and was the the secret to getting along well in society, really. And in fact, if we think about it, not much has changed for us, has it? Just like then, uh, today, opinions about who Jesus is abound. Was he just a Galilean wise man? Was he a a countercultural crusader? A Mediterranean peasant who went about doing good and spouting pithy maxims, who was turned into a god centuries later? Was he just a myth? Now, just as in Paul's time, Jesus was a controversial figure. And the way to get along fine in the world is by avoiding being too dogmatic about what we believe about Jesus. And perhaps it's one of those identities that describes the Jesus that you like and the Jesus that you follow. But Paul's aim in this letter to the Colossians is to proclaim the true Jesus Christ, to present everyone mature in Him. And if that's to happen, if we're to truly be transferred from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of light, if we're to grow in the knowledge of God, if we're to bear fruit in every good work, then we can't just have a Jesus of our own making. We need to know Jesus as He truly is. Because sometimes, not knowing who you're dealing with can go terribly wrong. And so Paul's goal in these verses is to open our eyes to the fact that however big your view of Jesus might be, Jesus is bigger. Here's how Paul begins in verse 15. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things and in Him all things hold together. That is an astonishing claim about Jesus. A little over 30 years before Paul wrote these words, Jesus had been brutally crucified by the Roman authorities in Jerusalem. He'd been subjected to the most humiliating, shameful execution possible. An execution that was designed by the Romans to dehumanise its victims. For pious Jews like Paul, anyone hung on a tree was cursed by God. But just 30 years later, still in living memory of that execution... Paul writes to the Colossians and says that this same Jesus who was executed by the Romans is the one who created everything that exists. As the beloved Son of the Father, He is the one 
in whom, through whom and for whom everything that exists was created. It's out of the eternal overflow of the Father's love for the Son that everything that exists is. It is for Him, but not only for Him, it's also in Him and through Him. Paul is saying that the Son is the agent of the Father's creative work. As John's Gospel puts it, when God spoke everything into existence, the Son was the Word, the Word who made it all happen. And because the Son is the one in, through and for whom all creation was made, Paul says he is the image of the invisible God. That sounds kind of paradoxical, doesn't it? How can you be the image of something invisible? What Paul means is Jesus is the perfect, visible representation of who God is and what He is like. When God created man, the first woman and the first man, they were made in His image, weren't they? If we think back to Genesis 1, they are made to represent God in His creation. And if you know anything about those first chapters of the Bible, you know that they failed in doing that. Israel, God's chosen people, were meant to bear His image, to bear His name as His representatives to the world. But if you know that story, you know that they failed too. They bore His name in vain. And you and I, as the descendants of that first man and that first woman, we were made to bear God's image too. But we fail. We're meant to be like mirrors reflecting the goodness and the glory of God to the rest of creation. But because of sin, we're at best cracked mirrors reflecting a distorted image. But when the Son comes into the world, we don't look at Him and see a cracked, distorted reflection of God. In Him we see the real thing. We see God in the flesh. The Bible says that if you want to know what God is like, you look at Jesus. If you want to know what we were created to be like and what God is transforming us into, then you look at Jesus. Jesus is the image of of the invisible God. And Jesus is, Paul says, the firstborn over all creation. Now, plainly, firstborn here can't mean that Jesus is the first out of all of the created things. That's what our Jehovah's Witness and Mormon friends will try and argue, but the context here clearly doesn't allow us to say that about the Son. He is not another created being. You know, Paul makes clear that he's the one in, through and for whom everything that was created exists. He is not another created being. And when Paul calls him the firstborn, what he means is that Jesus is the heir of all creation. He's the one who is going to inherit all rule and authority from his Father. Being the firstborn in the Bible isn't so much about time as about status and rank. And particularly here, Paul seems to be thinking of Psalm 89. It's a psalm about God's promises to David the king. And verse 26 and 27 of Psalm 89 say this. They say, He will call out to me, You are my Father, my God, the Rock, my Saviour. And I will appoint Him to be my firstborn, the most exalted of the kings of the earth. It's God's promise to Israel that their king will be the most exalted of all the kings of the earth, the king of kings who will rule over everything. And again, just like we saw with the image of God, being the firstborn was the privilege of God's Old Testament people but a privilege that they constantly failed at performing. 
from Adam as the, the pinnacle of the creation account, who could be rightly called the firstborn, to Israel as the nation that God calls His firstborn, to the kings of Israel and Judah, everyone who was called to perform the role of the firstborn failed dismally. Everyone except Jesus. He is the true King of kings that every other firstborn, Adam, Israel, the kings of Israel, every one of them pointed to Him. And the reason that the Father gives Him this this position of rule and authority is because He's the Creator of everything. Everything on earth, Paul says, everything visible, whatever you can see and feel and touch and taste, everything was made by the Son. Every bit of it was made in, through and for Him. All of it was created to point us to Him. Wherever you look, at the beauty of a sunset or the power of a tropical cyclone, the incredible complexity of each cell in our body, all of them are made not for us to look at those and go, how amazing are they? But to point us to Him, for us to marvel at the One who created them. And every bit of it was created for Him to rule over. And yet that's not just the truth for the physical creation, Paul says that he rules over the heavens too, doesn't he? Everything invisible, every unseen spiritual reality, every power and authority in the heavenly places was made by him and is ruled by him. Every throne, power, ruler and authority owes its very existence and its allegiance to the Lord Jesus. In heaven and on earth, there is no rule or authority so great and powerful that it doesn't have to bow the knee to the Lord Jesus. I wonder how you feel about the authorities that are over us. Perhaps it feels like there's lots of reasons to be fearful or reasons to be cynical, Uh, whether it's your boss in the workplace, uh, our state or federal governments, or perhaps you even have a sense of the spiritual forces that oppose us as God's people. And quite rightly, we should think of brothers and sisters in countries that face much more severe persecution than we do here in Australia, simply for identifying as followers of Jesus. But Paul encourages us here, instead of cynicism or fear or despair, he says, look at Jesus. There is no authority, no power, no throne, no rule, not a single one of the authorities that you can think of is outside the rule and authority of the Lord Jesus. All of them will give an account to him. As the creator of everything, the one who is in the image of the invisible God, Jesus is King of kings and He's Lord of lords. Now, Paul's focus changes as he gets to verse 18, doesn't it? He's been helping us look up and look out to see who Jesus is, to get this massive picture of someone who is bigger and more powerful than we can possibly comprehend... And then in verse 18, Paul turns his attention from Jesus and his authority over everything in creation to his authority over the church. And just like Paul's picture of Jesus sounds shocking to someone who knows him as that shamefully executed criminal, so what Paul says about Jesus and the church is incredible too. You see, our world doesn't think much of the church, does it? At best, it considers us outdated and irrelevant. At worst, we're bigoted, hate-filled enemies of freedom and fun. And if we look at ourselves in the church and then we look out at the world, often we can feel 
weak and oppressed and marginalised. We can feel insignificant. But consider the church in relation to what uh, Paul says about the Jesus we've just met. See what he says in verse 18. He says, He is the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Jesus doesn't see the church as weak or irrelevant or disposable. Instead, he draws his people into closest relationship with himself. So close that Paul can say Jesus is the head and the church is his body. The church is part of his very self. And that means you and I, as his people, are united to the one who has all rule and authority in all of creation. And so, no matter how outwardly weak the church appears, how insignificant we seem to the world, then even the smallest church, you know, three old nanas with an out-of-tune piano, they are the body of the one who rules over everything. The church is unbreakably bound up in God's plans for Christ and for creation. We play a central role as the people of Christ who will live on with Him in the new creation that He's bringing. But as always, the spotlight here is firmly fixed on Christ, isn't it? Because not only is He the King of Kings and the firstborn in this age, Paul says He's the firstborn in the age to come as well, the firstborn from among the dead. Because the reality is that we don't see Him as He really is yet, do we? While He is the one who created and rules over heaven and earth, not every power and authority willingly recognises His preeminence. In our world, sin and darkness still get in the way. But by raising Jesus from the dead, God has drawn back the curtain on this future age where sin and death are abolished. He's given us a sneak peek into what's to come when God puts an end to this creation as it is, when He finally destroys every power that dares to stand against Him and He creates everything anew. And by raising Jesus from the dead, God the Father has shown us that Jesus, His Son, will be the one who rules over this new creation. He's not just the King of Kings in this age, He's the King of Kings in the age to come as well. Through His resurrection from the dead, God brings about a new beginning, a new age, where His Son becomes, in fact, what He already is by right. And all of this, Paul says, is so that the Son might have preeminence. All of creation, heaven and earth, will bow to Him in praise. Why does the Father give such a position to the Son? Paul gives us two reasons in those verses, doesn't he? First, he says that all God's fullness dwells in Him. And once again, I think Paul wants us to hear the echoes of the Old Testament. God's desire for the world is that it will be filled with His glory. He wants us to know, He wants the whole world to know what He is like. Israel knew something of that with the temple, didn't they? When God made His presence dwell among them in the temple, His glory filled the temple in Jerusalem. But now, Paul says, God delights to make His fullness known through Jesus. When we look at Him, we see the fullness of God's glory and His wisdom and goodness, the fullness of His grace, the fullness of His power. 
of his mercy. Everything that God is, everything that God wants us to know about himself, we see in Jesus. God the Father gives Jesus preeminence because he's the full and final revelation of God himself. But secondly, God gives the Son preeminence because of what he's done. This one in whom the fullness of God is pleased to dwell, God in the flesh, laid down his life. He shed his blood on the cross. The cross, remember, is the most shameful, dehumanising death possible. It is violent, it's degrading and it is bloody. But the shedding of blood isn't here to remind us just of the violence of Jesus' death, It's to remind us that his death is a sacrifice. You see, it's through the shedding of blood that God promises forgiveness. And so through the blood of his son's sacrifice, we're told that God has now reconciled all of creation to himself. Through his cross, Jesus brings peace to a world that is torn apart by sin. Now, we need to tread carefully when we say that, don't we? What does it mean for all things to be reconciled to God? How can everything in the material earthly realm and in the spiritual heavenly realm be at peace with God? You see, we can't read this passage in the light of the rest of the Bible and make the conclusion that everyone will ultimately be saved. We know, don't we, if we read the rest of the Bible that if someone rejects Jesus and his authority, then they'll face his judgment rather than his forgiveness. So what does it mean for everything to be at peace with God? Well, as, as Paul wrote this letter, the Roman Empire was in an unprecedented period of peace, the Pax Romana. This 200-year period of peace that brought safety and security and economic prosperity to the Roman Empire. But that peace didn't come because Augustus got everyone to agree to get along together. It came off the back of the defeat and subjugation of every opposition. You see, the peace that Jesus' blood wins here invites us to picture him as the conquering Lord. When he comes in his glory to finally stamp his authority over all of creation, everyone who has willingly submitted to him will experience the peace of his forgiveness. But peace will also come about when those who reject his rule are cast out of his kingdom into the depths of hell. Peace in Jesus' kingdom comes when the King of Kings destroys his enemies. One day, every account that he keeps will be reconciled and every debt will be paid. Some will experience his reconciling forgiveness and some will experience his reconciling judgment. Jesus isn't just the Lord of this creation, he's the Lord of everything that will come, but it's your relationship to him now that will determine what happens to you on that day. Now, the believers in Colossae are an example to us of what Jesus has done for those who willingly submit to him. They are a picture of reconciliation accomplished and applied to believers. See what he says in verse 21. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behaviour. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you wholly in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Since that first sin of Adam and Eve in the garden, all of creation has been alienated from God. 
Our sin distances us from Him, so we're separated from the One who is the source of all true goodness and joy and life. We are cut off from the One who sustains all things. It is a deep and terrible alienation. And whether we're aware of that vertical alienation between us and God, it flows out into every other part of our existence. The reason every relationship that we have is, uh, is not entirely free from some measure of hiding and shame. Most of us have things that we don't want, even those who are closest to us to know. Things that make us feel entirely alone. There is no relationship that is free of conflict or difficulty. Our relationship with our environment is broken. Even our relationship with our own bodies, they get sick and they age and they decay and they don't work the way that we want them to. All of that comes from our ultimate alienation with God because of our sin. But Paul says, now, for anyone who has put their trust in the Lord Jesus, that alienation has come to an end. As Paul will go on to say in chapter 2, the record of our sin that stood against us with its legal demands, those sins that alienated us from God, that record was nailed to the cross with the Lord Jesus. Through that gruesome and bloody death, Jesus has brought reconciliation where there was alienation. Where there was hostility, he has now brought peace. Where we lived in evil deeds, he brings goodness. And the the mind-blowing thing that Paul says about that death, this death that has such immense, far-reaching, universal significance, is that the purpose of that death was for you. Christ did it, Paul says, to present you blameless before his Father, without blemish and free from accusation. Yes, the incarnation, the life, the death, the resurrection, the reign of God the Son has cleansing effects on all of the universe. Through it, all of creation is reconciled to God. But Paul says, the ultimate purpose, God's aim in handing over his son to death is focused on us, the church. So that in us, his beloved son would have a body of believers joined to him and glorifying him for eternity. His aim is that on that day when every knee bows and every tongue confesses that he is Lord, you and I would be presented to him as spotless and blameless washed free from every sin as a testimony to His grace. If you've asked Jesus for forgiveness, if you've asked for His help to follow Him, then that's true of you right now. Maybe there are times where you feel blemished and unclean, either because of things that you've done or things that have been done to you, but however you feel... It's a fact that Jesus has washed you clean and you're spotless in his sight. Maybe there's times where you feel unforgivable because of the horror of your sin or because of the fact that you've given in to that same temptation over and over and over again. But however you feel, Jesus has forgiven you. You are blameless before him if you've put your trust in him. But friends, make sure that you do consider and examine yourselves to see whether that really is true of you. Because it's entirely possible for you to come to church each week and read your Bible every morning and live a nice moral life but not be cleansed and forgiven. You can come to your to church your entire life and not be a Christian. Those things are the fruit of being a Christian, not the cause. 
What truly makes someone a Christian is confessing your complete inability to make yourself right with God, to change yourself and make yourself acceptable to Him. And by trusting that Jesus has done everything that's needed to make you right with God. It means willingly bowing the knee to Him and taking refuge in His grace. And the proof of your salvation, Paul says, is that you will hold fast to that truth. Paul says, those that are saved are the ones who continue steadfast and unshifting in the faith. The faith there in verse 23 uh, is synonymous with the gospel. The faith is the message that the Colossians heard from Epaphras when he first came and preached it to them. Not some mystical experience, not some esoteric understanding but a message, good news about the Son of God made flesh and crucified for our sins. A message about the one who reigns over all creation. Paul means that those who are saved are the ones who hold fast to the fact that salvation is entirely God's work, made possible and offered to us through the death of His Son on the cross. It's for those who confess that there is no point in the Christian life where we stop being entirely dependent on God's grace to us in Jesus. That's the gospel that Paul says the Colossians had heard, which they'd put their trust in and now has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. It's a message of universal significance that Paul says must be proclaimed to the entire creation. This Jesus that Paul has introduced us to, he's infinitely more than anything we can think of, isn't he? Much more than a a wandering holy man, a cultural revolutionary or a wise sage. If that's your view of him, your view is far too small. Paul wants us to lift our eyes and see the Jesus that he's holding up for us, the one who's the creator of everything that exists, things in heaven and things on earth, things visible and invisible. He wants us to see the one who sustains it all by his powerful word, who rules over everything with power and authority, every throne and ruler, the one who is the image of the invisible God. Paul says, look at him and see what God is like. And Paul says, come to the one who has reconciled all of creation to himself through his bloody sacrificial death on the cross because it's in that death that he has washed away every blemish and he's satisfied every accusation against you and Paul wants us to join with the rest of his body the church in proclaiming the supremacy of the one who rules over everything as the king of kings and lord of lords Jesus Christ the son of God Friends, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you for what you have done through your Son, the Lord Jesus. That in him and through him and for him, you created everything that exists. That you are pleased to have your fullness dwell in him and that you are pleased to give him all rule and authority. And we praise you, Father, that in your great mercy and grace, you gave him over to death on a cross so that we would be reconciled to you, that we could be presented to you wholly, without blemish and free from any accusation. And so, Father, we pray that you would help us continue in the faith that we've heard, not shifting from the hope that is entirely in Jesus and help us to boldly proclaim his rule to every creature under heaven. Father, we pray all of this in his name and we pray it for his glory. Amen. Uh, We're going to sing again, uh, Beautiful Saviour. Please stand.
congregation as we go out into the world this week, do so in the strength of this Lord our God, Jesus. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. And all people said, Amen. Thank you. My name is Pastor Andrew and you've been worshipping with us today at the Christian Reformed Church of Toowoomba. Whether you're local to Toowoomba, whether you're joining us from somewhere else in Australia or around the world, we're glad that you could join us as we worship our great God and Saviour together. Especially if you're local, we would love to see you. We'd love to meet you and have you join us for worship. That's part of God's plan for humanity, that we gather together as his people and worship as brothers and sisters in Christ. If you'd like to join us, a church that exists to glorify God by growing in faith, sharing our hope and serving in love, then we would love to see you. You can visit our website at toowoombacrc.com or visit our Facebook page. Either way, you'll be able to get in touch with me and find out when our service times are. We'd love to see you with us. Wherever you are, though, may God be with you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Amen.